Okay, hi everybody and welcome to our uh, resumption of the Glamour uh, webinars. It's been almost two months now with the conference uh, intervening and all of that process and I do hope that you've had a chance to tune in on some aspects of the conference if you were not able to be there because I think uh, I think it worked very well to bring the second ray forward and give us a, <clears throat> a deeper understanding of that uh, major ray on our planet and in our solar system. Uh, I'd like to, uh, we have uh, today uh, quite a few people. I'd like to welcome you, uh, Alexandra, Angela, Anne, Anna Marie, uh, Antoinette, Ario, Barbara, Bianca, Carl, Clesia, Dana. Uh, Denise, Gregory, Gretchen, uh, Jan, uh, Jean-Pierre, Joe. Uh, Joe's in many places. <laughs> okay, uh, John, John Pluta. Hi, John. Uh, Karen, uh, Gritzka and Karen Johansson and Marianne. Uh, Mariut, Martha, Nienke, uh, Olivia, Stacia, uh, Suzanne and Susan and Suzanne. Yeah. Welcome to everybody and. Uh, Joe Waltz and uh, uh, B.L. Allison are backing us up on technical, uh, the technical aspect of things. I guess there's a couple of handouts there as well that you can download uh, as, you, as you wish. Well, um, I, why we've uh, been away, I can't really say that the glamour in the world has... Uh, dramatically decreased, unfortunately. Sometimes it seems to be thickening. And I think we're going to work um, here on a kind of a, an egotistical glamour. It's called the glamour of personality. And it's something that we all have to deal with. Uh, we'll be reading through the book. That's what we're planning to do. And there are many people whose eyes are fixed on the little self. And unfortunately, um, that gives a very limited point of view and disturbs the group process and certainly eventually the international and world process and the process of humanity becoming, uh, should we say, a harmonious family working forward towards uh, the wonder of the new age, as the Tibetan puts it. So uh, let's just do a little alignment uh, before we begin our reading, and then we'll have a chance to ask questions um, as, we, as we move forward. Um, I, actually, we've done quite a bit of these, a few of these programs. Uh, Olivia, Tuya, and I started this some time ago, and it's just one little effort uh, along these lines. Um, the issue is uh, for us to make an inner esoteric attack on the world glamour. But of course, that means that we all have to take care of our own issues, which are so difficult to see. They're, they're <laughs> fairly obvious to other people. Each one sees and knows the villainy of each, as it's said in the rules of the road, and yet there is with that great revelation, no turning back, uh, no spurning of each other, no shakiness upon the road. The road goes forward in today. So obviously we're going to see the other person's glamour sooner than we see our own. That's a problem. But okay, um, eventually we develop sufficient detachment and sufficient identification as the soul to begin to see how things are working out in our personality. And we can overcome that great glamour of personality, which is essentially the glamour of the dweller on the threshold, which stands between us and the portal of initiation. And gradually that has to be uh, dissipated. And in this book, we talk about uh, that process as well as the uh, dispelling of illusion, the dissipation of glamour, and the uh, dispersion of maya. So let's just um, align together 
<clears throat> and with the group soul, the collection of egoic lotuses, which occurs when groups come together, we seek the soul's perspective, which is certainly not our ordinary personality brain perspective. We seek to see and understand as we would as if we were uh, focused on the higher mental plane, which uh, yet for most of us is not yet uh, the case. As DK tells us, that's the reason we fail in our meditation. We don't really yet know how to focus within the causal body, within the egoic lotus. And that's written a hundred years ago, almost uh, in letters on occult meditation. But we imagine, at least. We imagine. That our truer nature is really the soul nature, and we understand that, and we don't just long for it, but it becomes a uh, practical <clears throat> reality in our lives. And from that perspective, the usual glamours with which we are confronted, and certainly the glamour of personality, is dissipated. There are other higher issues about illusion and uh, problems even of getting uh, stuck, so to speak, within the causal body and not wanting to follow the Christ with all of the sacrifices that are entailed in that process. But okay, those things still lie ahead of us and we have a lot of clearing work to do first. So before we begin, we'll um, simply sound together the great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. <clears throat> From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Oh. Oh. Thank you. I use this, you know, little pitch pipe here because every note has its own particular uh, ray value. And I oftentimes use one of the second ray notes 
which is a G, and it is the blue note, and it's the note uh, on which even our solar logos is said to be sounding. This is the blue solar system. This is the G solar system. This is the Sol, Do Re Mi Fa Sol solar system. And the previous solar system was on the note Fa, which was the green note. But now we moved into the blue, and that's why I use that particular note often, which is associated with the uh, great second ray. So some of you are joining us along the way. That's great. And uh, I've welcomed everybody. I'm not going to go through it again, but uh, uh, welcome to you who have uh, just been joining us. Okay. Now, um, let's see here. Where are we? <laughs> ah, yeah, here we are. Well, it's been about a couple of months, really. Um, we were supposed to start again on the 13th of April, but uh, that was conference preparation time. So it's about two months. And uh, we'll begin with a little closing that DK has. This is on uh, page 24, I guess. And he says uh, to his group, See, they've been studying, basically, if you look at it, the uh, destruction of the dweller on the threshold, and that is uh, dependent upon the devitalizing of the general Maya, by whatever definition that comes in. There are a number of definitions, and the uh, dispersion of it, as it's sometimes called, the dissipation of glamour, and the uh, dispelling of illusion. It's uh, so interesting that these three words, um, glamour, illusion, and maya, they can be used in a um, general sense as well as a uh, specific sense. When you use the word uh, specifically, uh, maya has to do with the etheric currents and whether they are organized or not, or whether they're chaotic. Uh, glamour has to do with the emotional field, and um, illusion has to do with the mental field. But, you know, you've been reading, maybe even before you started your work with Master DK, and you've seen that illusion covers all the things that are wrong. Uh, glamour, uh, similarly, and Maya, the great world Maya, covers glamour and illusion as well. So there's a general way to look at these words, and there's also a specific way. And as we go along, we'll see what they are. So these are the requirements. When we study this book, and then that's what we're doing now. We're going through the book carefully. It's going to take a few years. We'll work in that way. Um, we have... Uh, to deal not only with glamour, which is the major problem, of course. It was the major problem in uh, World War II, where Germany was the major expression of glamour and uh, Italy of illusion and Japan of Maya, but Germany was the worst. And glamour is the worst, and our problem with the astral body is the worst on this um, planet, uh, which has not yet solved uh, in the more cosmic sense, its own cosmic emotional problems, which is kind of interesting. It's way beyond us, but our uh, planetary logos is not yet a cosmic initiate of the second degree, and therefore there's a lot that is problematic in uh, his astral body. He's in a masculine incarnation, just as Venus is in a feminine incarnation at this time. And, you know, for most of us as well, and for the majority of students uh, in DK's groups, they had not yet taken the second initiation, and they still had plenty of personal glamour to deal with. And the problem is it's fairly well uh, invisible to a lot of us. Uh, we have these things, and we don't know it. And gradually, uh, when they're pointed out to us, we're shocked, you know, that this is the way we've been behaving. But that's how it is, and one day we'll see clearly. So basically, um, he's telling us um, the acuteness of the intellect, 
and the illumination of the mind plus love and intention. See, intention is applied to Maya. It's the will working to organize the etheric currents will accomplish much. And to this service, I reiterate, I repeat my call. Um, so the next part here, uh, he's asking a little bit of an assignment for these people, and maybe we can take to heart what he asks them to do. Um, during the next few months, I would suggest that you do three things. And now he's asking for some real uh, mental analysis here, and I wonder if we, in our own way, could take the effort to go through the kind of analysis that he's requesting here. Define in your own words, and as the result of meditation, that means not just leaping into it, but really thinking deeply about it, your understanding of the four expressions with which I have been dealing. Okay, the destruction of the dweller on the threshold, the uh, uh, dissipation of glamour and the dispersing or devitalization of maya and the dispelling of illusion. I ask for a real analysis and not just for four sentences of definition. So he wants everybody to think deeply about what these distinctions are and begin to notice them in our own nature. And before I enlarge upon this subject, I would ask you to organize your minds on the matter using definitions as a guide to your thought, yet stating the problem as you see it, and seeking to see the differences existing between these four aspects of the world glamour. And notice uh, how he includes Maya and illusion and the dweller as part of the world glamour understood in a general sense. So, you know, maybe we should take out an hour of our time sometime and uh, or a bit more and give our best analysis of what these four different states of obstruction actually mean to us and to the extent that we can see them, how they operate as inhibitory factors in our life. None of us is free of this. Uh, you know, if we were fourth degree initiates, we'd really be free of all this, but we're not. Uh, illusions exist even after the third initiation. And actually, if you really want to go into an amazing thing, he said, he says, you don't get rid of illusion uh, until the ninth initiation. And then the question was asked, does that mean that the masters are still under some so for form of illusion? He says, yes, but illusions of such a high nature that to us they are like truth. Now. Um, this is interesting. Say each day with care and thought a very familiar prayer, the Lord's Prayer. It has many meanings, and the trite and usual Christian significance is not for you. Okay, maybe for those who are strictly aspirants and are not really working towards discipleship, it's for them, but not for you, because you are assumed to be uh, disciples in training. Ponder on this most ancient formula of truth, he calls it that, and interpret it entirely in terms of a formula for the dissipation of illusion. So that's quite an assignment. Write an exegesis on it from this angle. See, he, he gave them tasks to do. Whether they all did it or not, that's another matter. Uh, write an exegesis on it from this angle, taking it phrase by phrase and regarding it as giving us seven keys to the secret of the elimination of glamour. Here he's looking at glamour in the larger sense. The formula, and it, it, this is interesting, it's called the Lord's Prayer, but it's not essentially a prayer, it's a formula, can be divided as follows. So it would be invocation to the solar Lord. Who is that solar Lord? Maybe it's your solar angel. Maybe ultimately it is the solar God of our solar system, but it's enough to take a representative of the sun, which is the solar angel, and begin to work with that. Then seven sentences embodying seven keys for the dissipation of illusion, things that we have to do in an occult manner to get rid of illusion and a final affirmation of divinity. Here is the uh, Lord's Prayer. If I can just get that here as it's supposed to be. 
And this is, you know, from the King James Version. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. And you all, you know, probably know it by heart. Maybe the word instead of debt, debts and debtors, it's uh, you use the word trespass, but it's all the same. Our Father, which art in heaven, so hallowed be thy name. We respect the name of the solar Lord and consider it to be holy. Uh, thy kingdom come, meaning that the plan that is in the mind and consciousness of the solar Lord, the solar angel, must appear upon the earth uh, within the lower 18 subplanes. The realm of the sun must appear within the realm of the moon. The lower 18 subplanes are the realm of the moon, and the kingdom of the solar god must come into the realm of the moon. Thy will be done in earth, interesting, not just on earth, but in all these planes as it is in heaven. What is heaven? Well, it's beyond the 18 subplanes, and from a certain point of view, heaven is the cosmic mental plane. So <laughs> I don't think we can reach quite that far, but the will of the soul has to be done upon the, uh, or within the earth and on all the subplanes. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Give us the prana that we need uh, and to be used in the right way to sustain our vitality so that we can do thy will. And uh, forgive us our debts, our karmic debts, as we apply forgiveness, as we forgive our debtors. And to the extent that we understand what forgiveness is, so we will be forgiven. Now, all of these are methods of dispelling glamour and the great illusion. And lead us not into temptation, but temptation is not just that which is low. It's not only that which lures us into the uh, lower 18 subplanes, but there's a kind of a temptation uh, toward the higher uh, subplanes. Uh, you know, it was rampant in Roman days when the rulers thought that they were gods and they uh, sought to have some kind of godlike exaltation and to rise way above the human state. It was a huge illusion, but it was a temptation. And deliver us from evil or from the evil, as it is sometimes said. And this evil is something that can consume us. But is but if we keep the proper alignment with the soul, we will be delivered from the evil of the lunar realm. You know, the 18th card of the tarot is the moon. The 19th is the sun, I think. And... Uh, we have to extricate ourselves from the realm of the moon, which is a retrogressive and decaying realm, and as far as we are concerned, is a formula for evil, uh, lunar magic. And then the great affirmation, he says, for thine is the kingdom, uh, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of truth, the kingdom of reality, and the power far above anything we can have, and the glory, the radiance of the great solar lord forever well uh forever is a big term but at least for quite a while and then we would add to it an om rather than an amen i think so he says there are seven different ideas here the hallowing of the name is one uh the kingdom coming is two the daily bread is three forgiving of the debtors is four uh, leading not into temptation is five and delivering us from evil is six Maybe I forgot one in here somehow. Anyway, there are seven that we can count out, he tells us. And they are, what does he say? A formula for the dissipation of illusion and the elimination, basically, of glamour considered in the larger sense. So he asks us to interpret these things in an esoteric manner, and uh, he asks us to write about it, and each one of us can do that in terms of our own... Um, understanding of how we are faring dealing with these matters maybe we have not overcome everything here as well maybe we do not forgive maybe we are tempted um maybe we are not sufficiently in contact with soul to be delivered from the evil maybe we do not hold the name of the solar god as sacrosanct and somehow hold other things just as high 
Maybe we're not doing what we can for manifestation. Maybe we don't even know what heaven is. Maybe we don't use etheric currents in the right way. So, you know, uh, apply it to yourself and see how it works. And as the Tibetan says here, use your intuition and apply these all to the subject of glamour and see at what knowledge you arrive. So obviously he's giving us an assignment and if we want to take that seriously, uh, we'll do that. Now so often, believe it or not, uh, his students just didn't do what he asked them to do. That's amazing because probably most of us would say, well, if the Tibetan asked us to do something, we would do it. But here we're very sincere disciples who just didn't do it, you know. And finally, he had to call the experiment to an end, largely because uh, there was a lot of disobedience and uh, a, re a refusal, really, to follow what he suggested. Then write it down in the form of an interpretation or article, and we, we the group, the glamour group, um, group number two, the observers of reality, we may arrive at much value. Then, uh, you know, these are instructions before he gets into the general subject of glamour. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Um, yeah. Okay, keep a copy of your full moon record. And at the close of six months, you know, he would hand hand this into Alice Bailey and the Tibetan would review all this, subject it to a careful analysis and see what is the sum total of gain. Divide your analysis into the following heads and express your understanding of the phenomena. So he's asking us to be very, very observant at the time of the full moon because certain kinds of impressions and phenomena may occur to us, which signals the opening up of our sensitivity. Uh, and it will happen then rather than at other times because it's a time of uh, very great uh, possible contact. So has there been any real contact? And I suppose that means also contact with the real. Did you see any color or phenomena? Okay, it may not be significant, but it may signify a sensitization. And any other phenomena, auditory, uh, visual, tactile, uh, olfactory, you know, uh, or in the gustatory in terms of your taste. Uh, so he's asking for extreme sensitivity at the time of the full moon. So these are, you know, things to which his groups were subjected at the time. And um, if we wish to make progress, we can take them seriously. Uh, that we may, uh, here's his, you know, usual exhortation that we may all go forward into greater light and understanding and that the light may shine upon the vertical way of the disciple. Notice that the vertical way of the disciple is my prayer and aspiration for you. And he's showing that even a master can have prayer and aspiration, that it is not um, unfitting for a master to pray and to aspire. But what is the aspiration of a master compared with our own type of usually quite uh, astral and rather limited aspiration. So those uh, with, with those requests to do a certain kind of work, he closes and then gets into uh, the nature of glamour. And we'll at least begin this. You know, there's a lot to this book. And, uh, you know, just keep, keep note of things that interest you. And then when we have a chance to discuss these matters, then um, you'll bring them up. Okay. So let's uh, think together about all of this with a clear mind, with a, you know, a serene astral body, with the control of our etheric currents to the degree possible, and with the general identification as the soul which prevents us from identifying as the dweller, which, of course, is the big problem. Uh, even a dweller which is uh, relatively, uh, what shall I say, uh, advanced. Maybe that's the greatest problem, when your dweller is advanced and you, why shouldn't I identify with it? Okay. All right, the nature of glamour. Let's go on a little bit, and then I'll turn it over to you and any questions that you may have. 
uh, or thoughts that you may have, then we will uh, work with them. Okay. In the preceding pages, we dealt with certain definitions of the words frequently used, I see, look, interchangeably. In other words, glamour, illusion, and maya are oftentimes used interchangeably over the course of the literature which has developed about the obstacles that exist um, uh, in, in the way of the developing disciple. Okay, dealing with illusion and glamour, we found that, what did we find? Okay, try to get here so I can see. One, and, and now let's just really concentrate on this because we want to be able to observe it in our own nature. Words are just words unless they are filled in by true observation, true recognition of what they mean, the energy of it. Um, and, you know, there's a big difference between just using words and understanding what the uh, energy is. Illusion is primarily of a mental quality and was characteristic of the attitude of mind of those people who are more intellectual than emotional, I guess you would say, you know, people who have a strong third ray, a strong fifth ray, uh, and in general, the hardline rays will be subject more to illusion, but it, there's not necessarily a ray limitation upon illusion. I think when we reach the stage of uh, mental uh, unfoldment and mental identification, we are subject to illusion. They have outgrown glamour, as usually understood. So there are higher forms of glamour that perhaps they have not uh, outgrown. It is the misunderstanding. Now think about that word. You know, someone says something and you would interpret it according to the present state of your mind and you don't get the real meaning. It is the misunderstanding of ideas which are coming from high places and thought forms of which they are guilty and of misinterpretations. So they don't know how to apply the information to the whole in such a way that it is truly meaningful. Something is meaningful when it comes into the world of the soul. Something is truly significant when it enters the world of the triad. So the original reception may be quite good, but how do you interpret it? and you lay your old concrete thought forms upon it, and it no longer has the same meaning as it is meant to have uh, within the higher worlds. Now, usually, I think it's the concrete mind which is doing this, but to a certain extent, we have a problem with the abstract mind as well, which can be illusory when compared to the intuition. Uh, glamour is astral in character, uh, you know, and is far more potent at this time than illusion. Now, notice this, owing to the enormous majority of people who function astrally always, and I, you know, it's my impression <coughs> that maybe 80 or 85 percent of humanity functions um, astrally always. Uh, these are likely not so often to be moon chain types, although there are still some relatively undeveloped moon chain types who may still be subject to glamour, but they tend to be more um, subject to illusion or at least get rid of the glamour more quickly because they have an inherently mental bias, which is associated with the number three. But if you really look at earth chain humanity, uh, there's a very strong emotional bias and the great majority of people, as we can see, if we look around and just follow the news, uh, well, they are functioning astrally always and they have to be led by idealism rather than by ideas. Maya, if we're being specific about these, is vital in character and is a quality of force. It is essentially the energy of the human being, the whole human being, as it swings into activity, you know, on the physical plane, etheric plane, 
through the subjective influence of the mental illusion or astral glamour or both in combination. So Maya uh, has to do with the action of the human being and whether these energy currents are mindless, what does he call it? That unthinking emotional mess. That's kind of what, you know, it's driven by habit and it's driven by unconscious desire uh, or conscious desire and it, it and it results in chaos on the mental plane so it's very important for us to organize our etheric currents the seventh ray coming in is going to help a, a lot of humanity do exactly that whatever your ray may be it's going to be a more uh, organized world so here you know are some preliminary uh, definitions of illusion, glamour, and Maya. You might pause for a moment, you know. You might uh, look at your behavior. Because believe me, none of us is free of any of this. We're not free. <coughs> if we were free, we'd really be approaching the fourth initiation, and we're not. So, you know, what is it, what is it to which we are most prone? And I will say this, that um, the Tibetans' writings are very useful in helping the average intelligent consciousness uh, to disabuse itself from the factor of illusion. He, he has such a, a clear way of thinking and of uh, speaking that if we pay attention and really think along with him, as he says, you know, a master's words carry a special power. He advises us, don't water them down. Don't think that you can come along and change my words and have anywhere near the effectiveness that my words will have. He tells that to some people, well-meaning people, who said, oh, no one's going to understand what the Tibetan has said, so let's make it, let's water it down. No. Uh, and if we follow him clearly, we will go a long way to bridge the concrete mind into the abstract mind and into the intuition and many of our illusions will be lifted and we will no longer interpret things the way the average person does we'll have much more soul light upon it much more triadal light so you know ponder on these things ponder on this because they give real insights. And then, this is interesting, you know, the dweller on the threshold. So much glamorous stuff is written about that great beast of a thought form. It says, you know, it's really our personality in a way. We, the personality, are actually the dweller on the threshold of initiation. He says it's always present. It swings, however, into activity only on the path of discipleship and not really the path of aspiration. So all of us, hopefully, are treading the path of uh, discipleship, or at least, uh, you know, are becoming, uh, moving more and more towards the stage of true discipleship and accepted discipleship. Um, it comes only into activity on the path of discipleship, little chalership, chale in the light, that kind of thing, preceding the stage of accepted discipleship. When the aspirant becomes occultly aware of himself. This is not just the usual type of self-observation, but can really begin to sense the energy currents which are at work and whether they are chaotic, well-organized, whether they represent the purpose of the solar lord, which he actually is. You are the solar lord. You are the soul. You are the monad. All of them are solar lords. So the, he becomes occultly aware of himself of the conditions induced within him 
as a result of his interior illusion, he can stand back and actually see. He can recognize the things in which he had been invested before and sees them as a condition of his vehicles, his astral glamour and the maya surrounding his entire life without awareness, without observation. Who is the true observer? The monad is the true observer. You as the real being are the true observer. You stand back, you stand back, you stand back. It's called Pratyahara uh, in the Yoga Sutras. It's the fifth uh, means of yoga. And eventually you see, you know, and that's different from being immersed in the very thing that you have to control. You can't control anything when you're in the middle of it. You have to stand back. Okay. Being now an integrated personality. Now think about that in your own case. And no one is a disciple, my brother, unless he is mental as well as emotional, which is a point uh, the devotee oft forgets. Uh, these three conditions, with the preponderance of the effect in one or other of the bodies, so, you know, it depends on where the major focus is in our personality, are seen as a whole. And to this whole, the, to the whole personality, with the preponderance of emphasis in one of the vehicles, and to this wholeness, this integrated personality, the term dweller on the threshold is applied. It is in reality a vitalized thought form embodying mental force, astral force, and vital energy. And uh, the soul has created it, you know. Uh, this thought form, that's how it is. Uh, basically, without the soul, we would not have the building of any aspect of our personality. But our problem is we identify with it. So changing our identification is the main thing. And in order to do that, we have to stand back from the fields in which we were previously immersed. So all of us, this process of withdrawal is extremely important in order to get a grip. That's Vulcan, isn't it? To get a grip, a willful grip upon the ways that the different aspects of the personality are behaving. The problem, therefore, before all of you in this group is to learn, first of all, number one, to distinguish between these three uh, illusory aspects, uh, illusion, glamour, and maya principally, and then their sum total, the dweller on the threshold, to discover what conditions in the environment or in the individual constitution induce these situations of difficulty. And that's, that's not easy to do. And number three, to find out what methods are effective in inducing a cessation of the bewildering, um, deceiving conditions. Let's, let's just pause there for a moment. Let's just pause. So can we really, you know, standing back as if we were at a point of abstraction, can we see, can we distinguish between these three illusory aspects in our system? Do we know, of course, this is just very abbreviated, right? But you could really ponder on all of this. Do we know what are the triggers, you know, the conditions in the environment or within ourselves which make these 
difficult situations arise? What triggers us in terms of uh, Maya, glamour, or illusion? You know, what, what is it that may make us physically chaotic or, you know, act physically in such a way that our purpose does not come through? What is it that causes us to exaggerate or minimize on the emotional plane and lose the sense of proportion? And what is it that does not allow us to see the forest because we're just involved with the trees, you know? All the bits and pieces, the many perceptions, and we can't put it together in wholeness, and thus we're stuck in illusion. What are these triggers? So, you know, I can't pretend that we can do that suddenly, but you know, you can, you'll have this and you can check out these questions, whether uh, you do so uh, from a video or from a book, doesn't make any difference. We have to examine ourselves. Uh, remember, he says, it must be remembered also that these distorting conditions notice all of them are distortions not just glamour glamour is particularly distorting but it must be remembered that these distorting conditions found in all of you are the medium whereby you are tuned in on the world glamour and illusion now notice found in all of you these are his students. These are people on the periphery of his ashram. These are people like ourselves and maybe in many cases more advanced. We have it, you know, these distorting conditions. We just don't see reality. Okay. We don't see it the way it could be seen. We don't have the realization. We don't have the revelation. So we have to really examine its careful work. The emphasis has been laid in esoteric te teaching on the training and liberation of the individual aspirant. And this, of course, is necessary for the mass is made up of individuals and in the steady release from the control of these uh, inner delusions will come the eventual clarification of humanity. Now notice, uh, it's all about uh, clarification. And that's why, you know, sometimes when we look at group number two, the observers of reality, the trained observers, we're talking about uh, those who are clarifying human consciousness. Well, I think, um, I think that's going to be enough for right now. Uh, I think so. And uh, let's just say that this would be the end of, um, well, let's see, uh, of the, I forget what I've been calling it, but the end of the Glamour reading, number 13, I think. And I'm not sure what page we're on here. Uh, we're on page 27. We've covered three pages. Page 27. And today is the 8th of June. Here, uh, 18, 
and the next will be uh, the beginning of our work together reading next week. Um, it'll be a morning schedule, I guess, beginning uh, of Glamour reading number 14. Um, although this is probably the 70 something program, uh, and we'll start with uh, page uh, 27, and it'll be 15th of June, etc. Okay, so your thoughts now on the basis of what we have covered, your questions the, about the kind of self-examination that may be needed, your any recognition of the tendencies which which you have. You know, I mean, we can be wrong, but we have to guess. You know, the soul works through one vehicle. But it doesn't, it can be any one of the three. The personality works through another of the vehicles. And that leaves one vehicle free. Now that vehicle may be so well trained that there's no problem. But sometimes when a vehicle is not under the impression of either the soul or personality, it can go its own way and be difficult to train. Sometimes I look, I have a third ray physical vehicle. I, I don't think it's under the impression of either the soul or the personality. I think that's where my problem is. It's in the general, you know, uh, you know, use of energy on the physical plane. Is it sufficiently orderly? Is it, is it chaotic? You know, that kind of thing. So I think I have a lot of regular, I've got myself personally, a lot of regulation to deal with in terms of my etheric body and its relation to the physical body. And maybe you will find, as you examine your personality, where the particular area of danger may be. I mean, it, it's going to be the the personality for everybody, and the whole glamour of personality is a big problem, but there may be a particular area which is most difficult for you. And as we read along, we're going to discover that, um, oh, yeah, this is the 8th, 8th, 7th, 15th, yeah. We're going to discover that unless we take care <coughs> of our own liabilities, our own delusions, we will not be in a position to help very much uh, in the world. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Take a little water here. As I say, you know, after the conference, it's always in Phoenix, and I always leave with my Phoenix cough, I call it. And then uh, in, in Finland, things... Uh, start to clarify the air is cleaner here and i should be over it within a few weeks so <coughs> but meanwhile it is what it is so your thoughts uh your thoughts and um let's see i'm going to michael uh, yes yes go ahead is that is that it's bl bl yes bl Yes. You have a couple. You have a couple of comments. Um, I just lost them. Let me see if I can. Uh, I see a question go. mark from Suzanne Miller. Yeah, and one above that from Frida. <coughs> okay, very good. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, ba 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 ba. So some people had some technical stuff, but that's that's taken Thank care of. That that okay, very good. Okay. So hi, Michael. Can we infer from this reading? that the personality and the dweller are the same. Yeah, eventually uh, it ends up being the case when the personality is highly organized. Whoa, someone's trying to get in touch with me here. <laughs> when the personality is um, highly organized and when the person is quite advanced and in an integrated state, then that integrated personality, when functioning on its own, according to its own um, tendencies, uh, is very much the dweller and a very high-grade personality. Uh, it's very efficient and very useful in the world, can be a great obstacle. So that can be, uh, that can be a problem. 
and um, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, we're we're all getting to that point. You know, that we uh, are almost there. I mean, people like ourselves uh, are sincere disciples, and we're integrating our personality and all that. Yeah, so the personality will become the dweller, but not in a low grade state. No, the dweller depends upon the integration of the personality. Otherwise, it's just the vehicles you're dealing with. But once you get a high grade integrated personality, there's a real problem, especially at the fourth initiation. So, but you know, that lies ahead, so we don't have to worry about that so much. Okay, so Suzanne, the dweller is like a mirror as we begin to see ourselves, okay? Perhaps the symbol of for Venus, yes, which uh, is closely associated with the soul, and Venus is a mirror, right? So like a mirror can become more of uh, where we can focus our gaze to see as we uh, tread the path. Well, we have to have this examination of the high-grade integrated personality, but in order to do that, we have to stand back and not identify with that personality. That's the whole problem. It's a question of identification. If we are identified as the personality, then we have the problem of limited vision, very uh, limited vision. And therefore, pratyahara, the ability to disidentify with every vehicle, plus the sum total of all vehicles, and to focus the consciousness on the higher mental plane or within even the abstract mind. Uh, this is what is desirable for us. When we are truly a third degree initiate, we will be able to focus uh, within the causal body at will, and we'll be able to focus within the, within the abstract mind at will, and not just uh, hope that some sort of impression will come to us, because that will be our true uh, locus of operation, L-O-C-U-S, locus of operation. So... Um, what do we see through that soul mirror? That's the big question. Do we see the personality as it is? And can we stand back and no longer be identified as that personality? Then we have a chance to control it, of course. Okay, now let's see. Uh, okay, so your questions, and I, I move some of you over to uh, um, to the staff side. Uh, you know, if you, it's harder to raise your hand there. So BL and, and Joe and Tuya there, uh, if you have something to say, just speak up just the way BL just did. Okay. Now, so other thoughts, other thoughts or questions that you may have, you know, at least, at least examine them. Like I say, you know, I, I certainly can't answer everything. I just give you my best understanding. At the moment, this is a deep, deep book. The group was not a success. None of the groups was a success. None of them was a success. Not even the group of 24, the new reorganized C group in 1939 and 1940. It was not a success, at least in terms of what the Tibetan had hoped, although some of the people did gain greatly. But that wasn't the point. He, his point was to make a group success, but he'll have another chance because this project is a apparently a 275-year project. You know, I think it started in 1925, so there's knockoff 75 years. You've got the year 2000, 2100, 2200. By that time, we should be uh, pretty well into the conclusion, and the seeds should blossom. Okay, or at least sprout, or at least to be covering the world. Other thoughts uh, on the basis of what we have been reading, what he wants his students to do, the Lord's Prayer, the copies of the full moon work, you know, then the nature of glamour, illusion, glamour, and maya, and also their general use. And the general dweller on the threshold. Look, the main thing is, and we're going to be studying this or thinking about this with the glamour of personality. We are not the personality. It is our instrument. 
but maybe 80, 85, 90% of the people in the world are caught thinking they are the personality and unable to stand back and identify from a different point of view or at least or disidentify with what they've been identifying with for thousands and thousands and even in some cases millions of years. So we are not the personality and those people who think they are are bringing into the equation all kinds of personal values when it is soul values which should be emerging at this point internationally on the world stage. Can it be so? Well, people like ourselves have to somehow contribute to that if we can. So your your thoughts, your questions, other questions, other thoughts. And BL, if I don't see them, or Joe, if I don't see, then just help me see, okay? I don't <clears> see any hands, and I don't see any more, so uh -oh. everybody's still deeply thinking. Oh, okay, we're, we're in meditation. Okay, there's Alexandra. Okay, so Alex, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, hello. Speaking about the international <coughs> world stage. Yes, Alex. And the bewildering, deceiving conditions. Mm -hmm. And 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 not 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 to not to put it out there, you know, as you say, keep it, you know, close within what work we have to do. Mm -hmm. Um I when I think of the dissipation of glamour, I think of the dissipation of distraction. Mm -hmm and the and the and the need for focus mm -hmm. and so i was reading which obviously that's a big um big situation we're facing now in the world and personally um so i was reading in cosmic fire um i know you know this by heart but if I can just quote, much that is to be seen now of a distressing nature in the world can be directly traced to the wrong manipulation of mental matter by man. A uh, gigantic thought form hovers over the entire human family. Uh, this for thought form has been broken up and, oh, sorry, every wrong thought when embodied in speech or manifested in action on the physical plane goes to swell the proportions of this evil entity. Mm. Therefore, the pla place of man in the cosmic plan becomes more vital and apparent when it's realized that one of his main responsibilities is the direction of energy currents from the mental plane. So that's what we're speaking of, isn't it? Um, it necessitates a clear comprehension of the power of thought, of the direction of thought mm. currents, and the science of thought building, which I have been studying extensively because I've been reading and, and researching a lot about what's being discussed now um, in public discourse amongst the intelligentsia, mm. which is the, um, okay, that it's not just the information age, it's the age of attention. And this is being discussed unbelievably in so many areas and on so many platforms about the distraction mm -hmm. of, and the, and the persuasiveness. And as Aldous Huxley said, man's infinite capacity for distraction. Ah, ah. So, yeah, so I think that's yeah. the quote. I think that's the quote. Yeah, and um, so I, I, I highly recommend um, these two chaps, James Williams and Tristan Harris, who are young men who used to work in technology, and now they have decided they've had epiphanies, and they've realized that it's it's distracting everyone, and everyone's being persuaded, and and and, and losing mm -hmm. their focus. And they've written some marvelous books. And um, the conclusion of this one by James Williams is, in order to do anything that matters, we must first be able to give attention to the things that matter. Mm -hmm. It's my firm conviction now more than ever that the degree to which we are able and willing to struggle for ownership of our attention is the degree to which we are free. So I just keep coming back mm -hmm. to that um, again and again. <coughs> is, um, is the power of attention, the power of attention, the power of focus, the power of our our thought building um, in this work mm. of dissipating mm. the the glamour which ensues when there is there is so much distraction which leads to you know confusion. Right, right, right. Yeah. So good, so, good, good, good. You know, you're right into the whole realm of Maya here particularly and the 
chaotic energy currents which uh, prevent us from holding uh, a point of tension. We have certain world leaders who have very short attention spans and naturally okay. they yeah, <laughs> naturally they will let loose with all of the emotional factors which should be held in check by the true uh, uh, dharana, by the true concentration. Actually, you're, you're really talking about the very first step of meditation, the centralization, the Leo step, if you will. Uh, you know how it goes with Leo is concentration and the ability to sustain attention upon a particular object, followed by Virgo meditation, Libra contemplation, Scorpio illumination, Sagittarius inspiration, and finally uh, Capricorn initiation, and followed by still higher states. But it all begins with the ability to hold that point of tension and not be disrupted. And you know, and it is the um, technique technique of de despots to try to confuse the mind of those they want to lead like sheep. So we have a, exactly. a big problem along that line uh, today. And, and, and naturally, we as disciples, we have to hold the mind steady in the light internally and try to stabilize these chaotic, uh, myavic currents, which are causing such incredible disruption. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I just I just wanted to thank you and everyone who was responsible for the conference because I thought that was such an example of what um, a group can do uh, <coughs> together and focused. It was so powerful from the third dimension where I was the other dimension that I was watching from. You could you could feel the power, and yeah. it's it's just encouraging yeah. to know that as a group we can focus that's great I'm, I'm so glad you were able to tune in it's great to have you there in person as has happened and uh, also attending and holding a, a point of stability uh, in our streaming work so thank you for for being there I appreciate that very much okay thanks Alex for these good thoughts um, let's see um, let's see what else we have uh, anybody else wish to speak? Anybody uh, in the uh, group of uh, uh, over here? It says staff, but uh, you're most welcome to speak if you would like. Um, or I simply uh, move on into our meditation about the glamour of personality. Any any. Uh, Final thoughts. It's, it's a really a big glamour. It's sometimes associated with the first ray, but the basic problem of it affects everybody, and it's just uh, misidentification. I, I, what I call it is uh, the glamour of mistaken identity. And so in that sense, it blends over into illusion and into the great world illusion where we think we are what we are not, and as a result, <clears throat> make our decisions and pursue our actions according to a false premise. If we really were the soul in action, if we identified as a soul, we would operate completely differently. And that's one of the great requirements of harmlessness. You know, harmlessness is the life expression of the man who realizes himself to be everywhere, who lives consciously as a soul. Uh, whose nature is love, whose method is inclusiveness, and for whom all forms are alike, in that they veil and hide the light and are but externalizations of the one infinite being. I love that. Uh, I think it's so profound, you know, and I'm just, it's like an ongoing meditation theme for me, and I never, I never get past the first line. Glamour is the life expression of the one who realizes himself to be everywhere. That's a big problem. And uh, that's an amazing realization, if possible. It certainly will transcend the glamour of personality, if we can have that kind of realization. <coughs> okay, good. Then let's, uh, let's have a little meditation here. Just reminding you also that... Uh, 
Tomorrow we're going to be uh, dealing with our souls, uh, souls of Nations meditation at the 5 p.m. time, uh, or we may be doing some uh, emergency uh, interior work uh, in the world. Uh, our Saturday meditation tends to be that. Either we focus on various countries or we focus on uh, problems which uh, exist um, and which need some internal support. Two of you will be leading that. It'll be a broadcast. As I've said before, you know, we're doing with this ASK program, I think, what the Tibetan would have us do, livingly present in the work of triangles, the work of reappearance of the Christ, the work of attracting money for hierarchical purposes, uh, the work of dissipating glamour, and, and, and also then supporting the souls of the nations in which we are developing, which will allow the new esoteric schools and other hierarchical processes to really take place. Uh, it, it, you know, <clears throat> we're doing, there's some of the same meditations, always a little different, of course, some of the same meditations, but to be present in them and to be hitting in a rhythmic manner these major points which the Tibetan wants us to do, uh, I'm, I'm convinced it's very important. So uh, to the degree that you can join us in this, and remember, <clears throat> we now have a comprehensive ask link. Okay, and I don't know, Joe or Biel, if you can throw that in there, our comprehensive ask link, which will allow you to... Um, participate in any broadcast that we have, even if you don't have the specific um, uh, link for that particular broadcast. The comprehensive link uh, receives it all. So please do consider this to be kind of a rhythmic seventh ray spiritual duty to re-emphasize these points that the Tibetan thought were so important that he asked his group to perform these in a weekly manner. Uh, and then I think, you know, it's done, I, I just speak personally, it's done a lot for me, I want to say. And um, when I got back into it, uh, coming from, uh, uh, you know, all of our work at the conference, I was so somehow relieved to get back into the ASK uh, presentation where the science of invocation is really studied. It just felt like, oh, a real load off and uh, that I sh I'm doing what I should be doing. And I, I hope you feel that way too. All right. <clears throat> so here we go. <clears throat> we adapted just a little bit because there are quite a few of us, you know, and we can't do everything exactly the way he um, he suggests here, but in in smaller groups, and when you you know you should have your own dissipation of glamour groups, even just small groups, and you can do your work together. In smaller groups, we can follow exactly his instructions. <coughs> Excuse me. So all of us are together however many of us there are here, we are together on the plane of higher mind, imaginatively at least. And we sense the energy of the great solar angel, angel of the presence, filling our entire personality with its presence, as if just a little above the head, you know. Sometimes I've thought and wondered whether in inner space the jewel in the lotus isn't just a little bit above the head, six inches maybe, like uh, that so-called soul star, as it's called, you know. I've wondered, is that the very center? When I concentrate there, I feel it. Maybe you do too.
So in the silence we draw together. Now, this is dangerous work. Some of us have found out the hard way. And um, we need a protective formula. And he suggests this cross of divinity. And so we say the words together, and you can say them aloud where you are. As a soul, I work in light. And darkness cannot touch me. I take my stand within the light. I work, and from that point, I never move. And see that cross really radiant, really bright, really protective, a cross for each of us and yet a cross for the entire group, cross of divinity. Remember, he said, talked about the vertical life of the disciple. So we assume that we are protected from this major plane of illusion, which is the astral plane, <clears throat> using illusion in the larger sense, as he sometimes does. And we prepare by, we focus a dual light of matter and of mind. So here we have the etheric physical. We raise up this light of matter imaginatively onto the mental plane and the light of mind, our reasoning mind is found there so we can think in a vital manner. Those two lights come together and We imagine we contact now the soul light. However you want to imagine that. We bring down the light of the soul imaginatively, and we blend it on the mental plane with the light of matter, which we have raised, and the light of the soul descending. And now we have a triple light out of which will grow our beam, which is our beam of revelation and our beam of destruction. Eventually, it will turn into the horn of the unicorn. <clears throat> so the triple light is now one. Three lights are one. We can think with vitality inspired by the soul. And we say uh, together, the light is one. And in that light, we shall see light. This is the light that turns the darkness into day. The light of day is scorpionic. It's related to the intuition. And the darkness is glamour. Three times then, the sacred word. <clears throat> oh. 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 <clears throat>
So now we're equipped with this light, which is one light, and the source of our power and revelation in relation to the astral plane. So now the formula itself. And as we pronounce this formula, as the words are said, we visualize a great searchlight. And it's turned upon the astral plane. We turn it on, as it were, individually and as a group. We turn it on as we pronounce the formula. Radiance are we and power. We stand forever with our hands stretched out, linking the heavens and the earth. The inner world of meaning and the subtle world of glamour. We reach into the light and bring it down to meet the need. We reach into the silent place and bring from thence the gift of understanding. Thus, with the light, we work and turn the darkness into day. So we want that uh, eventually the clarifying light of the soul and the revelatory light of the intuition the light of pure reason and the higher Scorpio has its effect upon the lower Scorpio, uh, which is let Maya flourish and deception rule. But the light of day under Scorpio will dissipate the Maya and the deception of the astral plane. Now, let us uh, call upon the spiritual will it's in our very nature, it's in the monad, it's in the atmic level it's in the jewel in the lotus, it's in the sacrifice petals. Call upon the will, spiritual will, largely under Vulcan. And we're going to strengthen our beam. And we say, with power upon its beam, the light is focused on the goal. Now, for a while, I think we're going to work with this glamour of personality, which is blinding so many otherwise intelligent people. It's a great limitation. Consciousness is limited by the elemental life and is not given the freedom of the soul realm. So our beam is empowered. It's a beam of revelation. It's also a weapon in the dissipation of the blinding 
miasmic, clouding darkness, the gray fog. The sun will shine and dissipate the fog. If we do our work, the sun will shine upon the astral plane. So it's the glamour of personality we're going to deal with, and that is a unique type of limitation related uh, to egotism. You know, when on a national level, when you hear a slogan like America first, that's the glamour of personality. That's egotism on a national level. But of course, many countries are still at that level. And it's a battle between soul and personality of any nation, depending upon the wisdom of its leaders. Let's just say we're entering the age of Aquarius, both Russia and America have the Aquarian soul. That's what it's supposed to be. But Russia has a Leo personality. And the leader in America has a Leo ascendant. We cannot fall back into lower Leo. So here we throw the light into the glamour of personality wherever it is attacking. DK said it's a serious problem coming later, and maybe later is now, when there are many unillumined but integrated personalities uh, that think the world revolves around them. So we think in this way. And we say together, the power of our united light prevents the appearance of the glamour of personality. The power of our united light negates the quality of the glamour of personality from affecting humanity. The power of our united light destroys the life behind the glamour of personality. And in our five moments of silence here, we're going to visualize the light, our triple beam, as one, penetrating into the glamour and producing its weakening and dissipation until the sun shines through the clouds. So each in his own way, and yet all together as a group, let's do our imaginative work, keeping our protection alive.
and there will be <clears throat> a sun shining upon the astral plane. It will be the sun of the soul, the sun of the triad, the sun of the monad eventually. And this isolative, egocentric glamour of personality where the eyes are unduly focused on the little personal self will be dissipated. And let us see to it that this is the case in our individual lives so that we no longer take up the center of the stage of consciousness in a personal way, but that personality shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until it is simply a point. And then that point is relinquished, as it said in Leo, the relinquished point. We can meditate. And what that means, what happens when that point is really relinquished. And so, together and with protection still in place, we withdraw our revelatory and destructive beam, our weapon. It's on the mental plane, it's a triple light. We turn off the beam. And we keep working at this. Until we make some success in clarifying the astral plane and ridding it of its miasmas, its clouds, its fogs, its veils, all words signifying that which blocks the perception of reality. And so, We'll sound the Om three times, all of us, uh, ending this session. <clears throat> And over the course of the coming week, we keep our eyes open for our own individual distortions. He'll have a lot more to say about that. So that we can really be effective in a group sense. Tomorrow, the uh, work with the soul of nations and or emergency intervention work. So many things are going on which call for the international approach and there's so much selfish personal opposition to a real unified approach that will create eventually the consciousness of the one humanity. So we look forward to seeing you at 5 p.m. Tomorrow for our broadcast, just use the, uh, I hope it's in there. There it is. The comprehensive link. There it is. So just uh, copy that or download it or something.
and you can join us and we'll think in spiritually national and international terms. Thank you for your work tonight. And we continue with our, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with our ask program of invoking the higher energies to uh, create better conditions here uh, in the lower 18 subplanes of our planet. Lots of love to everybody. Uh, Olivia, Tui, and I uh, wish you all well, and we continue our work together. All the best, and see you soon.